Hi guys, so uh, today we welcome uh, Juan, who's going to talk to us about uh, simulating quantum physics with computers. <laughs> thank you for the introduction. <clears throat> all right, so thank you all for being here, and I'm just going to start straight away. Um, I'm going to talk a bit, oh well, yeah, I'm going to give uh, an outline first. I didn't write it, but just orally. So I'll go through the Schrodinger equation in 1D. Um, we'll solve it using a numerical method, one called the split step, which is a, a method that cons basically consists on um, using Fourier transform to go to a diagonal base for the uh, Laplacian operator. You'll see what I mean later. And then I'll show some results that you can obtain by adding more terms to the Schrodinger equation and making it nonlinear and using numerical methods as well to propagate uh, your solution. Then I'll go over very, uh, very over the top of the methods using the partition function, which as you know, or you will know eventually, is um, basically a formalism that encloses all the statistical qualities of a system. And you can use quantum systems for it as well. And we'll look at our, our solution where you can obtain the quantum density of a particle in a harmonic potential. So I'll just start then. So this is Schrodinger equation. A lot of you know it already. And I'll do something that's very common to do in computational physics, which is just to set any physical constants to one. And that's a very important thing to do because that way you, well, you have to be careful as well, but you kind of constrain your problem to ranges of numbers that are around one. Given that the numbers that we use are floating point, it's better not to go to very high orders of magnitude or to the very low orders of magnitude. So setting these constants that are always like 10 to the minus 34 or something to one, it's very useful. Um, now, the first thing you might think is that we have a continuous differential equation here. Uh, how do we put it in a computer? Because computers don't really talk about continuous numbers. And the solution to this is to do a finite approach. We basically discretize the space, the real space, into a set of points in a grid. In this case, I parameterize it by a line that goes from minus L over 2 to L over 2, and it has N points, N capital. So that's just the definition. And this implies that our wave function will be a set of points in each of these points in a grid. So we can also represent our wave function instead of a function that takes um, a parameter x and t merely just as a set of functions that vary with time, each of them located on each of the grid points. And the diagrammatic representation of this is just kind of this drawing where we see that in the real world, quote, we have a continuous function on a real continuous space-time, and then we just take some of the values in, in a discrete manner. And we do the same thing with time. And in time, we just, takes, we just take another step. Like in space, we took h, and in time, we take tau. And this is uniform steps. You can take another type of uh, approach. But this is very common to do. And what you do to propagate your solution through time is use a unitary transformation. Quantum mechanics, and in particular, well, many partial differential equations. But the Schrodinger equation, you can express the unitary evolution in time as just this exponential term of minus i time step and the Hamiltonian, which is this term that I showed before. And now you'll ask me again, why do we have a continuous partial, differenti partial differential terms inside this exponential? Like, how do we deal with this computationally, right? And I think the better thing to do is just to take it by steps now. So we have at least the potential, which seems easy to discretize, as we did with the wave function. So, um, yeah. Okay. 
I'll, I'll go over the potential later. <laughs> but, um, we have the potential term and a partial differential equation term. And those ones don't really commute. If you try to obtain the commutator of um, this differential operator applied to the potential, it just doesn't work out. They're not interchangeable. So we cannot separate the exponential, the terms inside the exponential into the into uh, concatenation of several exponentials, as shown in this slide. At least not perfectly. We can do, however, do this with an approximation, where we'll have some order of error in our computation. And one very common approximation to do this is using the baker campbell hausdorff which is just um, an expression where you can separate two operators that do not commute. When I say operators, you can think of matrices. And just take, take them as these three uh, different exponentials. And we have some error that goes as the commutator of these operators to the third power. So in principle, what we would like to do is to have this commutator to be very small, like 0.1 or something. So then our error goes 0.1 to the 3, so it's like almost energy blue compared to the to the actual computation we care about. All right, <laughs> so now we have um, this Laplacian term, this second partial derivative term, and we have our potential. We do the separation and we have these three terms. So I call it UK for kinetic, UV, and UK. And we can define them as this which is just a separation, right? Now, the potential term is very easy to do because we can just discredit the sizes the same way as we did with the wave function. So how do we express it? We express the wave function as a vector. We can express the potential um, term as a diagonal matrix where each of the diagonal entries corresponds to the potential evaluated at a given grid point. You remember we have x0, x1, etc. to xn minus 2. So this operation is uk times the psi function. And this takes order of n operations to do. So it's a very light computation, I mean, in comparison to the other one. Now, for the kinetic step, um, you can take other approaches, for example, taking finite differences of the derivative, which is just to say, you remember how you can define the derivative from um, infinitesimal step forward and step back? Well, you just take that, but you don't make it infinitesimal, you make it a finite quantity. Or we can make a trick here, kind of, where we go to Fourier space. And the reason we do this is because this differential term can be express as just a k term, a momentum term in Fourier space. So I just write here the definitions that I'll use for that. So let's just suppose we have here our function psi. We can obtain the function psi in Fourier space by doing this integration, this transformation. And we can do that uh, vice versa. We can obtain psi in the real space from the Fourier space one by doing the inverse transformation. So now, if we're applying UK to Psi, remember that UK was this um, I tau over four times the second partial derivative of with respect to X. So you can do this exercise of inserting this here into this definition, and you'll find that this Partial derivative with respect to x is just this term, k squared. Now you ask me again, why are we treating this continuously? Because we're not using, we're using a computer, right? So for that, we can just define the discrete Fourier transform. And perhaps you already know that the, about this. It's not that complicated. So we do a similar procedure to the real space. We discretize. We obtain a momentum spacing that I call p. And we can just write it like this. So each of the terms in the grid the, that was psi n will be expressed as a Fourier inverse discrete transform of this vector. We don't care about it at the moment. 
But now with this definition, every UK size step can be expressed as this thing. And if we look over the definitions of the DFT and the inverse in Python, we have they do this to a vector psi. Just adapting it slightly, we can express this step as this line, right? So it kind of we already solve it because we have the and and this is order n log n because we use a fast Fourier transform, and we kind of already solve it because if we have a given wave function in the beginning, we can do this kinetic potential kinetic terms over and over and propagate through time, whatever solution we have in pretty much arbitrary potentials, as long as they're well behaved. So for that, I'll just go over how can we solve it. I hope I don't bore you. I'm just going to start writing. So who has experience with programming here in Python? OK, so yeah, <laughs> I don't really need to. I don't really need to go that low, uh, slow. So I'm just going to import NumPy. Well, I'm just going to import some stuff that we're going to use later. I don't know why it is. Oh my god. <laughs> Sorry. So I'm using here the SciPy FFT pack because it has more functions, but you can also use the NumPy one, it doesn't matter. So we're importing the fast Fourier transform, the inverse Fourier transform. You remember that these ones are important in these steps, right? I'm just going to set up some plot styles as well. I set this SVG format because that way I don't have to like you'll see the picture and it's gonna it's gonna look good. <laughs> it's because it's a vector. Um, all right. So now what I was just talking about, we need to res this, define the real space. So I'm gonna just gonna say we have a hundred points. We have a length of ten. I mean we can just choose whatever parameters we want, right? Our spacing is then L over N, and we can just write our grid. This is the X real space. Okay. Now, we have our real space. Now the momentum space. So it's a very similar thing. I won't go back to the presentation, uh, but I wrote it there, why we define it that way. Okay, so we have it again, um, again the grid, but now in the reciprocal, no, in the momentum space. Now our time domain, so I'm just going to call nt and have um, 1500 points. That's for convenience, at the end you'll see that that makes a kind of a plot that you can see what's going on with enough time, you mean. 
And finally, I'm going to define some helper functions. So these ones are going to be this term, which is, I mean, it just depends on the grid in k, so which k value we have. And I'm going to define also this minus 1 to the L, which is, um, you can think it's just a phase oscillation that goes in every grid point, and that's because our definition of the DFT is different from the one in, in Python, just a shift, basically. And you can go over that. Um, So that's what I did there, and the exponential k squared. Okay. Now, um, let's just define the initial uh, vector we have, the initial wave function. So I'm just going to write this function that computes it. I'm going to write here on a Gaussian term, just for convenience. I mean, you can put whatever function you like as the beginning. And I'll show some results where we just adopt a different function. You can see something very interesting happening. So I'll just plot it. Well, maybe I'll play it at the end if you want to look at it. I mean, how this function looks like. We will also need a potential, and here's where I told you that you can just pretty much whatever um, potential you like. So I'm just gonna use just a harmonic one. And you'll see that I put a Gaussian here with a shift. So as you may have experience with quantum mechanics, you would expect that your wave packet will oscillate if I put it this phase from the center of the harmonic trap. You'll see it in the simulation. You don't have to solve it like analytically, although you could. Okay. Now, the... The potential and the kinetic terms, the, the steps. So this is a function that takes whatever wave function I have and applies this exponential v, which I haven't defined yet, but I, I will here. Okay, now the kinetic term. We're almost over. This is also to illustrate how quickly you can just write a script and and do something really interesting with it. So uh, here I'm just writing um, pretty much this expression. And now, finally, I can write a routine that performs this evolution. So I'm just going to write this thing, which performs the evolution and plots every steps, steps. <laughs> just to not um, saturate the plotting environment, or like the plotting functions, I mean. So here I defined my initial wave function. I define here the amount of time points that I'm going to output, similarly with the rest of these vectors.
here I'm just defining this uh, psi out will be basically all the wave functions as they, as they propagate, which I will then plot. So let's just start now. This is zero. And this is the first one. I'm just in this routine because um, basically I want to copy the, the content, not make another kind of assignation. Uh, all right. So now um, the for loop which has each of these steps. And here I write a, a small conditional expression where we're basically telling the interpreter to whenever you're in a step that you want to save, just save it. So that's what I'm writing here. Finally, we can return these vectors. Okay. Now we have this function, so it's a matter of running the running it. I'm gonna run with every twenty steps, saving it, and. Maybe you you have seen this before. It's just like a way to obtain, a, let's say, two-dimensional grid where you can plot it. That's a mesh grid where I use this x and t out. Okay, now let's just plot it. I'm plotting the density, so it's the norm square of the wave function. <coughs> and there we have it. Actually, I don't know why the, oh, I messed it up here. Yeah, so there we have it. We have this Gaussian wave function that starts here, center at one, and on the, the influence of this potential starts oscillating, which is the, the behavior that we expected. So what if we put something else, like uh, let's say an infinite well potential you normally see the infinite well potential solutions as these um, kind of, I mean, sinus cosinus, right? But in this case, we can just enter whatever wave function we want at the beginning and evolve it. So I'm just gonna do that here. <laughs> I'm gonna put here a zero to cancel this. And then I'll return this infinite well potential. It's not really infinite because I cannot put an infinite number in the computer, but I can put a very large one such that it's almost the same behavior. So here I'm gonna put it like if um, you're below minus four, 
you remember that we're, go, we're going from minus 5 to plus 5. If we're less than minus 4 in the position, we just have a very large potential. And likewise, if we're above 4. And then we turn it. Mm, wait a second. Sorry, I messed it up. So this is what happens. And you can see here in this kind of line that this is the 4. And that's where the wave function bounces from it. The wave function, if it's under free space, it will just disperse. As you, I mean, that's the behavior that we look here. But then when it reaches this place, this bouncing or reflections of itself start interfering with itself here. So yeah, we can do basically whatever kind of wave function we want in 1D with a potential that is sensible enough and evolve it in time. We only need to be careful about numerical error, but <laughs> at this point is fairly low in this particular case. So now, what else can we do with that is make it more difficult or more complex. And one way to do that is just to add this view. OK, so here I changed the notation a bit. Here I'm now talking about optical waves pro propagating in space, and this is approximation for it. But it's basically the same equation, where Z takes the place of T, and U takes the place of the psi. And it's still like a wave function itself, with am like amplitude, and it's complex. And here I add a nonlinear term to the Hamiltonian. So this nonlinear term contributes to self-interaction of this wave function. And this is the modulo squared of u in this part. And what can we see when we solve this is these modes that are called solitons. So these modes are also solutions for a nonlinear Schrodinger equation on Dirac's and external potential that conserve their shape upon propagation, which is not a very common behavior in these systems. And it even shows interesting behavior when you go to higher powers, like when there's too much self-interaction in this system. And you see this kind of breaking of the solitonic profile, resulting in some breathing modes that remain, which are even more complex to, um, to explain their origin, <laughs> kind of. Um, yeah, but that's what you observe with computational physics. And this is just the definitions of it. And then you might ask, this is only Schrodinger equation in 1D. How can we generalize it to higher dimensions? Because it starts to become very much, much more difficult. And another way to do it is just by considering partition function methods. And these methods are, as I said at the beginning, a way to enclose all the statistical significant or like all the important things statistically into the subject rho that's called um, the density matrix. But yeah, I mean, it depends how you call it, I think. <laughs> um, but then this rho includes all the statistical things. We have here in the definition a beta term, which is also called sometimes imaginary time. And it can be related to a thermal, tem like a temperature. And we have a Hamiltonian. And this Hamiltonian has terms that not necessarily commute. So it can be a quantum Hamiltonian. Like, you know, yeah. And what we do with this object is obtain its trace. And obtaining its trace is just basically an integration, or like, um, yeah, an integration of all the diagonal basis of this object. So <laughs> I'm going to just write here the definition of this density matrix in the x in the space representation. We can write it like this, where with this definition, we can express the trace of this density matrix, i.e. the partition function, as this integral of all the possible configurations of our system. 
our configurations in space are labeled X. So this can be N particles moving around in, in a box or something like that. I won't show you that, but the thing is that it can be generalized. And we do a similar thing with it. We discretize the time. And by doing so, we're kind of, um, we're kind of shaping the formalism for us to integrate it in a computer, basically. And what we end up doing is we have this um, kind of density matrix from a point x0 to a point x1 with a time step. Then we go from x1 to x2 with another time step, etc. Until we go throughout the whole time. And the time is this beta. So this is a different integral than this integral, just to not make it confusing. And um, the way we can see this is as if we are integrating up around this cylinder that represents time. And the things that we are integrating are all the possible configurations of this path. Sometimes, you, I mean, this is also related to the path integral formalism from another perspective, um, because they both basically enclose the statistical important things. But what we can ask now is that, okay, we have this funny picture, but what really is this? How do we calculate it in a computer? Because this is a fundamental object that we're integrating in this part, right? And let's just start again. We have this Hamiltonian term with a kinetic and a potential that not necessarily commute, but we can approximate by this product. And again, we have that in the potential term, we have a diagonal basis. So we just compute the potential of a given configuration. And for the kinetic term, we need to do a, um, we need to go again to momentum space. And I'm setting this kinetic term to be this P squared down P is, a, is an operator, but when we go to momentum, P is just a variable. And by doing this integral, I won't go into the details, but this um, kinetic term in X representation can be seen as just this propagator. So we have this Gaussian term that takes care of dispersing the, or like doing the fluctuations of the system. So return back, we had this um, interval over the configurations. We separated these configurations in different time steps, and then we can integrate all together and obtain the partition function. If we get the partition function, we basically have everything of the system, statistically speaking. And this integral can be expressed in this form, given that we already separated the potential and kinetic term. And now the question is, how do we integrate this? Because we have here, first of all, um, m, the m integrals, so a m dimensional integral, but this doesn't show the whole picture because actually these dx are n times d um, dimensional objects because we have, I mean, we can have n particles in d dimensions just represented by one of these differential objects. So, how do we integrate this super high dimensional space? And that's a point that we find in quantum mechanics a lot, a very large, like very highly dimensional space. We integrate it by um, using a Monte Carlo approach. And you'll hear Monte Carlo over and over when whenever you talk about these systems, because the Monte Carlo integration has a error that goes as one over the square root of n, regardless of the dimension of the system. If we did, for example, an approach where we discretize the space of this n times m times d dimensions, we're going to have a very bad error if we try to integrate it. And typically, we use something called a metropolis algorithm. And a metropolis algorithm is Let's just suppose we have, I'll just paint this picture. 
We have this configuration in the middle. We do some variations to it. Given a process, we can take a uniform, doesn't matter. We do some variations on it, and then we compute something which will be the acceptance probability. And you'll start jumping from each of these different states by this, uh, in this procedure. And in a conjunction, all of these states will be all the possible states that your system was at. You don't really know which one in particular was, but on average, you'll see it. And this is just the definition of it. I mean, you can define it as this is the, the transfer probability. So it's like the, the probability of going from a configuration x to an x prime. I just put it equal to x prime to x. And I will just say it's a uniform probability. So you pick one of the configuration points and shift it a bit. And then you compute this other term, which is how does the energy varies, kind of. And this will tell you if you accept the new step. The point here is that these energy variations is what gives you all your fluctuations in the system. As I drew in this picture, you can have a configuration line in red that goes like this, where your classical solution will be the purple one. And you have a kind of tendency of the system to be around this sh shaded area because of this exponential term. So if you go to a very high energy, those configurations will be exponentially suppressed. So it's another way to see it, like all the fluctuations are already encoded in the definition of it. And yeah. So for this, I'll just show you a real quick um, um, script where you can use this method for a one-dimensional system of like a, a particle in a harmonic oscillator. And yeah, it, it's very complicated to kind of go over it now but I can go over it later since we have not a lot of time left, I think. But I'll, I'll just run it and show you like how cool it is in obtaining these solutions. So here's obtaining the one for the Hamaric oscillator. So we will expect something like a Gaussian. If we have any, like if we remember quantum mechanics, you solve the Hamaric oscillator, the, the ground state is basically a Gaussian. And here we're plotting the uh, absolute norm square. I don't think I, I you can really see it here uh, written around. It was somewhere around around here. So this is the obtained wave function. Well, it will be. It's still processing it. This is the previous run. And we can also put other potentials like the Higgs one so you remember, you, maybe you don't know it uh, already, but this is a potential where you have a transition between having one minimum or like, yeah, you have kind of a flat minimum here. So it's an X to the fourth potential in this case. If I'm not, well, okay, never mind. Um, it is just this potential. <laughs> uh, I want like, say it wrong now. Is this potential when we set eta, which is a parameter to zero, we just have x to the four. Now, we have these different values of eta we can choose where we go from having one minimum to having two minimums. And in quantum mechanics, that means that you have very interesting solutions in these systems where you can have particles jumping from one of the minimums to the other one and vice versa. And in this method, sometimes you observe it, depends on the run. So in this run, we observe that we have some probability of being in this minus one minimum and some probability of being on top one, for example. <laughs> and yeah, so I think that's everything I want to show you. Um, thank you for your attention and let me know if you have any questions now.
Oh, yes. I didn't really go over it. Um, so there's two things. You can take it circular, you cannot. Um, I think the point... I might be mistaken. I think I've seen it being taken non-circular, meaning closed boundary con conditions, but it was in a... Yeah, I, I don't recall the example. Here we take it as periodic boundary conditions because we are doing a trace, if I'm not mistaken. So in this trace, yeah, here, when we go to the spatial representation, we have here a density matrix that goes from a configuration X to, to the same configuration X after beta time. So it can explore some of the other space in the configuration space, but at beta it has to return to it. Um, yeah, I don't remember. So this is the case for this part partition function. I don't remember if there's another one that I can point to you where this is not the case and you take another set of boundary conditions. Um, I don't know. I don't think it's that you're not interested in the periodic. I wouldn't as well call it periodic behavior. It's just that... Yeah, maybe maybe a way to see it is that we are interested in systems that stay in the same kind of behavior they are at. It's not necessarily, what I mean is, this is not necessarily that the particle is doing some periodic stuff, but we observe the particle as starting in a configuration and return it to it after beta time. In practical terms, we actually set beta to a very large number, and then we only recover the ground state, if I'm not mistaken. Um, for example, no. <laughs> I'm sorry, I cannot really. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if this is uh, a Hausdorff formula. Mm -hmm. The thing, I would say that if you want to take it the opposite way, so let's just return here. Yeah. If you want to take it the opposite way, then you're doing... Hmm, I wouldn't say that there's something fundamentally different between them. But there might be something that this you gain by doing it this way. I, I don't really remember. It's, it's a long time since I did this. Uh, but... Mm -hmm. um, the only thing that I would be worried about is this term, but this term only def depends on the on the psi wave function after this term, so it's, it doesn't matter that much. Uh, I mean, it doesn't even depend on time in in one of the exa in the examples, right? Um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe it's a better way because that way you only you only do the fast Fourier transform and inverse once every step instead of doing it every... And we can just try it, actually. 
like not gonna lie uh, by doing um, it's all just right so I do potential kinetic and potential so yeah it just, I mean there's something different <laughs> Ah, uh, it's something different because, uh, yeah, it's over four instead of over two, and I can just change that as well here. Okay. So I'll do over two, and then I'll do here 0.5. Yeah, it's the same. I mean, it looks the same. It's not really the same, the same, but you know what I mean. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. I don't really have experience with Julia. I've only done work in in Python and MATLAB and C okay. and C plus plus. But I've heard really cool things of Julia. So I mean, if you are not committed to a language, you should learn yeah, Julia. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> no. Yeah. Uh, I know Julia is very, very nice from second hand experience, not myself. Any other questions? Thank you, everybody.